Let us pray, please. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you now in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Thank you so very much, Lord, for allowing us to praise and to worship you, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, for your wonderful spirit, your wonderful presence, Lord, being here with us. Lord, I want to pray for each person, each family, Lord, who gave their tithing offering to you as an act of worship, Lord, and pray, pray blessings upon them and their families. I want to pray, Lord, for each person here today, Lord, they'll completely die to their will, die to themselves. I pray that you'll open up, Lord, their spiritual ears and eyes. They can see and hear and understand, Lord, your word. I pray for myself, Lord, that I completely die to my will, and I pray, Lord, for unlimited portion of your anointing power, your spirit to flow through me and upon me to allow the word to flow here this morning. If there's someone here, Lord, that needs to be born again or healed or set free or delivered from anything, Lord, let them accept you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Uh, I know uh, starting on this, this past Friday night on God's biblical calendar, I actually started the Feast of Tabernacles, and it was going to go the whole entire week. But normally I'd be preaching on that today. <laughs> but y'all know about a, a couple of weeks ago I was out, and I, I was either going to have to just skip it or not, so I decided I'm not. <laughs> so today what I'm doing is I'm going to finish up teaching on the second coming of Christ. And then next week, we'll teach a week or two on tabernacles because I want you to understand how important this teaching is. The sad part is, guys, most Christians go to church and have no clue what things they're even talking about in the Bible. Most people go to church and they've heard so many different versions of the gospel, they have no idea. Um, Gary and I was talking about earlier, and I said all the time, if you... Do not have the Hebrew understanding and the feast days uh, in the gospel. You, you do not have the right gospel. I promise you that. All through Old and New Testament, all the way through the book of Revelation, that's what it's talking about, the fulfillment of this. So it's important for you to know this. Most people think that if, if I say a, little, a little, little prayer and I believe in Jesus Christ, I get to go to heaven forever. None of that's biblical. That's not scripture at all. You're not going to say a little, a little prayer and then go to heaven forever. How many here knows that's not, that's not the Bible? That's not what the Bible says at all, okay? So we've got to understand biblically what's going to happen to you because everybody here in this room and across the world, you've been put here for a reason. You didn't come from some dumb monkey. You weren't here put by some fish. I'm sorry, that's not true. You cannot believe um, in either God created you or he didn't. You must choose evolution or God. You can't have it both ways. Sorry, it don't work that way. Um, so if you really believe in God and he created everything, which you really have to have more faith in that you evolved from a monkey or a fish than believing that there's a God out here that created everything. And if you really believe that, let me ask you a question. What are you even here for? What's the purpose? Just to breathe and to eat, to work and to live and go to bed every night? And do the very best you can. How many here knows that your best ain't good enough? Your best will never get you to heaven. If you're relying on you being a good person, are you doing enough to earn your way into heaven? You've missed it. You're never going to get there. See, I've been watching a lot of these songs. If you'll listen to a lot of these songs, it's actually in Scripture, but most people miss what they're saying. And you've got to understand, that's why it's important to know God's Word. Because you start hearing certain songs, you start seeing what it's talking about. Like one of the songs a while ago was talking about how we have defeated Satan already, but yet he'll be defeated again. And what's it referring to? It's referring to what I'm fixing to show you now. You have raptured saints, you have tribulation saints. And they're both part of the second coming at the end. Most folks don't have a clue about what I'm talking about. Most folks don't have no idea about the battle of Armageddon coming up. Most folks, next week you're going to get into, most folks don't have no idea that you're going to come back to this earth and live for a thousand years. And God's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. They've never been taught any of these things. We're just going to go to heaven and float around somewhere. That's not biblical, guys. So don't believe everything you hear or hear on TV or, or, or shows. What does God's word really say? Amen? Because if you want peace, how many here wants peace? I promise you, there's nothing wrong with starting a business. There's nothing wrong with having money. There's nothing wrong with any of these things. You should have all that God bless you with. Matter of fact, that's the whole point of this feast day is the Lord don't come back is he wants to bless you to be a blessing. How many of you believes that? He don't want you struggling either. God wants to bless your socks off. But 
Nothing you can do out here. Being a football star, a basketball star, being on TV and becoming a great singer. It all might sound great and wonderful. You go to Hollywood, but it's all said and done, you're still empty. You're still empty. There's something missing inside you unless it's filled with the Holy Ghost. And you can't be filled with the Holy Ghost unless Christ is there. And you can't have Christ there, hallelujah, unless you get born again. You understand that? That's why they get to know what these things are talking about. So we got started last week talking about the raptured saints, which is the bride of Christ. And you're not going to be raptured just by saying, I believe in Jesus. The devil believes in Jesus. A lot of people say, well, I believe in Jesus. That don't get you to heaven. What we'll makes you understand that? The only way you're going to be raptured out of here, which is a biblical concept, is if you have truly been born again and you recognize you was a sinner and you still are, hear me, but you know you need Jesus Christ. And you know when you accept him by faith, which you cannot see, you get born again on the inside. Something happens inside you because your conscience is the Holy Spirit dealing with your soul. And when you get truly born again and you put your faith in Christ, you get baptized into him and you become the bride of Christ. You become the church, hallelujah. Okay, that's why it's so important that you see this. And those folks will be taken up out of here, biblically the Bible says. That's called the bride of Christ. And we'll be removed first. So let's go and look at, a, at an area here. Second Thessalonians, if you don't mind going there. Uh, chapter 2. And here's where a lot of people who are what, what, what you call mid-tribbers or post-tribbers. How many of you have heard of pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib? And all that's talking about is, is, do you believe that Christ is going to take you up out of here before the tribulation period? Or do you think he'll keep you here halfway through it? Or do you think you'll have to go through the whole thing? And here's where they argue, what I'm going to show you now, there are scriptures saying that we're going to be here at least mid-trib or the whole thing. The problem is, is they, they're reading it out of context. So I'm going to prove to you the very scriptures that they use trying to say we're going to stay here. I'll show you the Bible says that we're not. We're going to be taken up out of here. I want you to watch this. Go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is important to understand about the second coming because, guys, there's, there's, there's two saints. Now remember, you have, you have the raptured saints and tribulation saints. Now watch this right here. Chapter 2, starting in verses 3. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day, what day? Not the rapture, the second coming of Christ. And I keep telling you guys, the second coming of Christ has nothing to do with you. I'm going to prove it to you in just a minute. Okay? Nothing to do. Now you're going, you're going to be a part of it. But if you're like me, you grew up in church thinking, well, the Lord's come back one time and he's called the Lamb of God. He was a baby in the manger, and he died for us on the cross. Hallelujah. But he's going to come back again, call the second coming, and get his church. That's not what it's called at all. That's not what it means at all. The second coming has nothing to do with you. It's about Israel. Okay, that's why before the second coming, he takes his church, who's made up of Jews and Gentiles, who's been born again, the bride, and takes us up out of here. Now watch this right here. Watch this very carefully. This is important. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, that's the second coming of Christ, shall not come except there come a falling away first. How many of you know what it's talking about? The falling away is called the apostate church. The apostate church is not the real church. Here's what apostate church is. Apostate church is people who go to church three or four times a year, they belong to Second Baptist, First Baptist, so and so Catholic Church, so and so Church of God Church, so and so Church of Christ Church, Pentecost, whatever they call it, a church. That's not the church. That's religion of man. That's denomination. And they go there and they follow a man's traditions or follow man's ways, and they try to please God by what they do. They go to Africa and they go to other places as missionaries, not trying to get folks born again, but trying to get you to become a Pentecostal or a Catholic or a Baptist or a Methodist. That is not biblical. There is no such thing as a Methodist or a Baptist Christian. No such thing as a Catholic Christian. No such thing as a Pentecostal Christian. You're either born again as a Christian believer or you're not. God don't see any of that garbage. God sees you either a believer or you're a non-believer, period. So if you go out here promoting 
a religion of man, you're out of the will of God. Hear me. I know that's not popular. Oh my God, Greg, going to get folks hating you. I don't really care. I love you enough to tell you the truth. I'm not going to sit here and bend my will as a pastor over to man's ways and man's religion to get more folks to come to church. Because i got to stand before Almighty God one day and God's not ever going to recognize that garbage of men. Hear me on this, guys. That's why this is so important that you see this of what it's talking about. I want you to, I want you to get a hold of what this is talking about. Because the falling away is not the real church. The real church won't fall away. The real church, the Bible says, will stand firm when the devil is attacking. The real church will pray for Donald Trump. The real church will stand against the evil that's around here. And you're in the world, but you're not of the world because you don't fit into it. But the fake church will try to fit in with the world. They'll fit in with all the Justin Biebers of the world. They'll fit in with all the folks who just go to church and makes the world around them like a church and brings all the religion of man back into it. We all become one. That's not from God. That's the apostate church, and you're going to find at the end of the second coming, you're going to see here in just a minute, to where that apostate church will be judged. But hear me on this, because the apostate church and the world are in bed together. But the true church is not. So let me ask you a question. When the world sees you, what, what do they see? What do they see? Do you fit in with the world system? Does everybody like you? If you're a pastor out here and everybody loves you, you're doing something wrong. I'm going to tell you straight out. If you're everybody's buddy and friend, and you're going to get on Oprah and all these TV shows, and this always leads to God, you're going to go to hell. That's not from God. Period. You're of the apostate church. You're lying to people, and you will have to answer before God one day. You say, well, is your way right? I don't have a way. There's only one way. It's the way, hallelujah. His name is Jesus Christ. He makes a way, but not many ways. You don't get to hold this, anybody. That's why it's just so important that you see this. A falling away must come first. And can you look around? Is it happening now? Yes. It's happening right now. A follower must come first. Now watch it. Here's where, here's where the confusion comes in. And that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Who is that? Who is this? This is called the Antichrist. How many here knows you have Jesus Christ? Christ is a son of God. Jesus is a son of man. Which means when you physically look at Jesus who was on the earth, what was inside him is Christ, the son of Almighty God. That's spiritual. Y'all seen this, anybody? The spirit of Antichrist has been on the earth for a long time, ever since the cross and, 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 and back. And it's here right now. The spirit of Antichrist is part of the apostate church. The spirit of Antichrist is everywhere. It's lifting up religion of man, lifting up Buddhism, lifting up yoga, lifting up all the fake stuff in church. That's the spirit of Antichrist. It's everywhere. But true Christ is what you're supposed to have inside you if you're born again. Y'all can hold this, anybody? Now hear me, but there's going to be an antichrist that's going to come into a person, a body of a person called the antichrist that will be on this earth. He's probably already here now, just not, just not revealed yet. And there's a reason why he's not revealed yet. You just keep reading, I'm going to show you why. Watch. That's what the Bible says. Look at verse 4. Who opposes and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that um, uh, he is his God. Now let me tell you something. What is, what, is, what is called God? What is called good? If you're out here in church and you're lifting up homosexuality, you're of the devil, period. If you're inside of a church and you're lifting up same-sex marriage, you're of the devil, period. I don't care. Well, that's just being mean. No, it's not. You're lying to these folks, telling them they're born that way and that they can go to heaven that way. They can't go to heaven that way. They're in the same category as a murderer, as an adulterer, as anything else you want to do you want to come up with us in, in the category of sin. The difference is a murderer and an adulterer and somebody who lies can recognize what they're doing is wrong and repent of what they're doing is wrong and God will forgive them. But if you tell somebody you're born that way and that you don't see it as a sin, you're going to go to hell, period. Because you're not going to go to hell skipping down the road of, 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 of God's aisle with Bobby and Joe holding hands. It's not going to happen. I'm sorry. 
God created marriage, hallelujah. And it's between a man and a woman. Y'all didn't hold this anybody. And I'm not being mean when I say that. I'm telling you straight out truth. If this is the kind of lies that people are putting out here, and people are falling for it. But God says, but real clear, that man of sin is of the devil. Y'all seen this anybody? Because if you oppose these kind of things, if you go against the evil, you're standing for God. But if you're, going, if you're for those kind of things, you're going against Almighty God. Which one is it going to be? For the devil or for God? Your choice. Look at this. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, all that is worship, so that he, as God, sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Remember, uh, Gary and I talked about this right here. Israel right now has got everything in place. They've already got... The red heifers, they got the, the, the snails, the blue snail, the dye, everything you need already ready to, to build the temple. And everybody don't realize, they said all the time. Even, in, even when I was younger, the biggest thing was in colleges was a big movement to uplift the Palestinians and go against Israel was what was going around 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And it's still there now, a movement against Israel. Because right now, upon that area sits what? On the Dome of the Rock sits the, the Muslims are worshiping their Allah, God, which is not my God. It's not your God either. But listen to me. Satan and the Antichrist will come and make a peace treaty that I showed you last week. And they'll bring that peace for a short period of time. And they will allow a temple to be built, which is not the real temple that's going to be at the end times. It's actually a false temple. And this Satan, this Antichrist, showing you right here, in the middle of the seven-year tre tre treaty, will come and exalt himself and go sit on the mercy seat in that temple. And in Israel, we're going to find out they've been duped. And then the real Christ, hallelujah, at the end will come back. And I'm going to show you that to you in just one second. Is anybody seeing this? And you say, well, it's not, it, don't, it don't affect me. Yes, it does. Everything that happens to Israel affects the whole entire world. It affects you too. So you can try to get around it all you want to, but it's going to be there whether you like it or don't like it. Y'all seen this, anybody? Verse 5, remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. Now watch this. And now you know, now watch very carefully what it says here, what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. Now watch, did you catch that? The Antichrist can only be revealed in his time. What time? See, if you know the feast days and you know the meaning, quote, Moedi of God's seasons, hallelujah, you know what it's showing you here. A lot of people try to take this out of context, like there must be a falling away first, then the Antichrist must be, be revealed, and then here comes the Lord's second coming. That's not what it says at all. You're reading it out of context. There's going to be a falling away, and it talks about the Antichrist, but it says he must be revealed in his time. When is his time? Watch this. Look at verses um, 7. For the mystery of iniquity doeth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And until he is taken out of the way, it's not time for the Antichrist to be revealed yet. Who is the he? Let's keep reading. Watch. And then it says, uh, shall the wicked be revealed. Not until he's taken out of the way. Who's the he? See, when you go back to the Holy Ghost, which is here only for the true biblical church, church which is you, he will take us up out of the way. Hallelujah. It's called the rapture. When he takes us up out of here, I promise you this, evil and darkness then will start reigning on the earth and then at that time it will be revealed. Because it shows you very clearly right here, and then shall the wicked be revealed whom the Lord shall consume uh, with the spear of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. Look at verses 9. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan and with the power of signs and lying wonders. So again, if you are here following signs and wonders in churches, be very careful because at the very end, that's what's exactly what's going to happen. If you're running up from church to church trying to find all these signs, miracles, and wonders, you're missing it. 
Because Satan can do signs, miracles, and wonders. Is y'all, y'all seen this, anybody? It's important to understand why this is important, why, what it means. Because I showed you last week, if you remember, when he takes the church up out of here and we're there, that's called the raptured saints. And I pray to God that you're one of those. But you will not be one of those if the world loves you. It's going to tell you right up front. If the world loves you and you're not being persecuted and everybody loves you, you will not be a raptured saint because you're not doing the will of God. You can only be, if you're truly born again, you won't do God's will. You're not trying to hide it. Does it make any sense? Now watch this. As that's going on, the Bible says, back on the earth, as I showed you last week, you're going to have three and a half years of tribulation period and three and a half years of great tribulation period. Last week, I got into the first three and a half years of it. You remember, there's going to be 144,000 Jewish preachers 12,000 per tribe will be here on the earth and they will be preaching uh, the kingdom of God, hallelujah. And then at the same time that's going on, while we're already in heaven, you're going to have Elijah and Enoch, which is the two witnesses, standing in Jerusalem preaching the kingdom of God. You're going to have Fox News and CNN and all these places, they're covering it, and no one can touch them. When they try to touch them, fire comes out of their mouth and will kill anybody who's around. That's what the Bible says. You're not going to touch them. They're going to preach God's kingdom. No, they're not going to be able to even cut the TV off. God's going to make sure the whole world hears God's kingdom during this time. Why is he doing this? Because I'm telling you, something happens at the end of the three and a half years of the tribulation period. Because if you're not born again, or if, you're not, if you don't have your head lobbed off. See, most folks don't realize this. When the 144,000 are preaching, and the two witnesses are preaching, and God's protecting Israel, you have Satan now who's tricking Israel with the Antichrist, with a false peace treaty. When he breaks that treaty, and he sits in that temple, and you've got the two witnesses who dies on the streets, the Bible says three days later, they arise off the streets as they're sending out gifts because of they, it's kind of, it's kind of, kind of like Donald Trump. You got folks right now who's praying and can't wait for Donald Trump to die. They're just hoping for it, having a celebration over it. It's the same evil that you see now that's going to be right there then when these two witnesses are preaching to God's kingdom. Everybody can't stand them, and yet God will allow Satan to kill those two witnesses, and they will die. And everybody's clapping and they're glorious and they're happy about it. But in three days, those two witnesses will rise again. And when they rise again and they go to heaven, the Bible says, it starts the great tribulation period and things change. Y'all with me so far? This is important that you see before I get into this next part of it. Because here's why. No one will be saved except Israel after the three and a half years. At, you listen, if you're here on this earth for some reason, you get left, and you're, going, you're not part of the rapture of the saints, you better not take the mark of the beast. It's coming. And those who refuse the mark of the beast, those who says no to Satan and the Antichrist, you'll get your head lobbed off. But here's the good part. You'll be part of the church then. Because you have raptured saints, and you have tribulation saints. And both of them will go to heaven one before the tribulation period and one at the end of the three and a half years, you're gone. Now, when everybody, when, when, the, when the two witnesses die and the 144,000 is done, then things change. Now, all of a sudden, we're going to show what the Bible says, we go to the great tribulation period. But hear me, the two tribulation saints... It's going to be tr- tr- the tribulation saints and the rapture saints are in heaven now getting prepared for the end of the last three and a half years called the seven-year tribulation period because something's going to happen. Are y'all ready to go deeper into this now? Yes, no, maybe? Okay, go to Revelations 19. Now some people say, I've never heard that before in my life. Well, probably because you go to a church that just has a joke in a three-point sermon and they preach you a salvation message every Sunday, and you heard the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over, and you're not, you know, you're not taught anything because you think when you die, you're just going, you're just going to go to heaven and just, just float around. No, that's not, that's not biblical at all. But that's what most churches are at because we're afraid to say anything. What does the Bible say about it? Look at Revelation 19, 
and look at verses 11 through 16. And watch this. This is the second coming. Watch this. This is very important. Church, this involves you and those who are left here. The tribulation saints, this also involves you. Watch this. And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called faithful and true. And in righteousness he doeth judge and make war. Who did you fix to make war with? Now let's watch. And his eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns, and, and he had a name written that no man knew but himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name was called what? The Word of God. The Word of God. You just got finished saying a while ago about the red letters. What do you think he's talking about? Because in your physical Bibles, the red letters that you see is what Christ has spoken. How many here knows Christ is the Word of God? And as I said before, and some religious folks got mad at me years ago, I held my Bible up and I says, if you take this Bible and you destroy it or burn it, you still cannot destroy the Word of God. And I mean, you could have thought the whole world was coming to an end because they worship ink and paper and leather versus the true Word of God. Are y'all getting a hold of this? You cannot destroy God's Word. You can burn the Bible, but God's Word's still here, hallelujah. Where is it at? It's inside of here. It's inside you. It's inside me, hallelujah. You've got to get a hold of that. Quit worshiping a statue of Mary. Quit worshiping a pew gave by Uncle Joe. Quit worshiping the carpet. Quit worshiping a Bible that's 1,500 years old. Who cares? Is God's Word inside you or not? Is it, is, it, is it moving? Is it alive? Do you trust it? Because this is what the Bible says has to happen here. He is called, hallelujah, the true Word of God. And He's coming to make war with those who comes against that very thing. Y'all seen this, anybody? Look at verses 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Who is the armies in heaven? It's the raptured saints and the tribulation saints who's in heaven now because you got your head lobbed off. You get prepared to come back at the end of the seven-year tribulation period and we all come back with him on white horses. Y'all getting a hold of this? Now you're, gonna, you're not going to have to do a whole lot. Just sit and watch, really. But you're going to be with him. It's not, but it's not about you. It's about Israel. Watch this right here. Look at uh, verses 15. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword that with it he should smite the nations. All of the nations right now that's coming against Israel, if America ever turns against Israel, we're doomed. We're doomed. Because God's chosen Israel as his chosen people and a remnant of Israel had their eyes opened up, hallelujah, and God started, you'll see here in a minute, a new covenant church made up of Jews and Gentiles. That's why these feast days are important. He says the holy convocation is forever. Look at this. Of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. With it he shall smite the nations and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treaded upon the wine presses of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He said, I don't believe it. It doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. It's still real. It's going to happen with you or without you. It's still going to happen. It's the matter is, what part are you going to be of it? Because this is going to be happening at the end of the tribulation. Now let's go to a deeper subject. Now let's keep going with this. Go over now to Matthew 25. Matthew 25. I'm showing this to you guys for a reason. Because there's so much confusion in the body of Christ. Because we sit here and we read and, and about how we get to meet the Lord in the air and He takes us up out of here. Hallelujah. Then you read here in Matthew something different and folks just turns it around and makes it a whole new religion or a whole quote new denomination theory which is not biblical. So what does the Bible mean? The Bible does not contradict itself. How many here believes that? It's just that you don't understand it. Okay? And I'm going to promise you this. I'm no scholar either. 
But here's what I do know. What I have learned, the Holy Ghost has taught me. God's Word never contradicts itself. Look at, look at this in Matthew 25. Look at verses 31 and look what it says. Now watch very carefully. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory and all the holy angels with Him, then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall He gather all nations. Now watch very carefully. And He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats. And He shall set the sheep on the right hand but the goats on the left. And then shall the king say unto them on the right hand, Come ye, and watch, blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundations of the world. For I was hungered, and you gave me meat. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was stranger, and you took me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison and you came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him saying, Lord, when saw we thee hungered and fed thee and are thirsty and gave you drink? And when saw we a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we sick in prison and came unto thee? Now watch what he says. And the king, I love the word king. It's important. Notice at this point, he's no longer just a Savior, Jesus Christ. At this point, it says King. Why? We're at the end of the second coming. He's coming to set his throne back up on the earth. Watch what it says here. Shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Insomuch as you have done it unto one of these least of these my brethren. I don't know, I don't know the word brethren. It's important to see this. You have done it unto me. Then shall he say uh, also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed unto everlasting fire, prepare for the devil and his angels. So everlasting fire is prepared for who? The devil and his angels. But all the nations that turns against Christ will be judged. Now here's where the confusion comes in. Notice what it says here. This is not the great white throne judgment. That's coming up next week and the next feast day we're going to be talking about this here has nothing to do with the great white throne judgment. And church, when was you judged? See, you was already judged in Christ when you got raptured up out of here, the Bible says. Then you have the tribulation saints also going up there in the first two and a half years. And the Bible says you sit at the judgment seat of Christ and you're judged not whether you're saved or lost, but you're judged on the spiritual works that's done through you and in you. That's where you get your crowns and all that kind of thing. Here, something else is happening. This happens at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. And get a hold of what it's showing you here. You have now coming back with him, which will be all the saints riding white horses at the end of the tribulation period. Now watch. He comes back. And here's listen, the sheep are the believers. The goats are the non-believers. But they're confused about the brethren. Who's a brethren? Look it up. The brethren, the Bible says, is those 144,000 Jewish preachers, 12,000 per tribe. For, for all this time in the tribulation period, they were sitting here preaching the gospel. It's referring to them, not to you. Again, hold this. Now, folks, to this day and age, has made religion out of it. We have prison ministries, go visit the sick in hospitals, and that's all fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But this is not referring to that at all. So, if you take this out of context to make a whole entire ministry out of it, you've missed it. Here in context, this has nothing to do with us. The church is already gone. This is talking about Israel. And those 144,000 who's been preaching and his brothers. So on the earth, it's what you have. You have sheep, you have goats, you have brethren, and the gospel now has been preached to the kingdom of God, to all the nations during the tribulation period. So that's what the Bible says. Y'all getting hold of this, anybody? Now let's carry it deeper. Go over to Matthew 24. 
I just want you to see God's word. God's word, again, always speaks for itself. Amen. But again, if you're not taught these things, you'll be confused. You'll say God's word contra contradicts itself. It does not contradict itself. Because how in the world can I want to fix and show you happen here in Matthew 24 if we have been taken up out of here? So does God's word lie? How many here believes God's word can lie? Nobody believes that. But here's the a, here's a understanding of it. Look at Matthew 24 and go over to verses 27 and look at what it says here. This is very powerful. For as the lightning cometh out of the east, now watch this, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For wheresoever the carcasses is there will the eagles be gathered together. What's it talking about? Immediately after the tribulation of those days, at the end of the seven-year tribulation period. Now watch. Shall the sun be darkened, and the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn. And they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven of, with power and of great glory. Let me stop right here. Remember, he came the first time as a what? Lamb. The second time he comes as a warrior, as a lion. Now y'all have heard me talk about how the lion lays down with the lamb. That's what it's referring to. Now, very carefully, in between the first and the second coming, he takes a church up out of here. We meet him in the air, in the clouds, and we go back to heaven. At the end of that, we come back with him, what it's referring to here. Now, watch. Look at verses um, um, 31. Now watch this right here. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. What's it referring to? How in the world could he come back down here? Here's what some folks teach. We go through the tribulation period. We go through all this hell on the earth. And if we survive it, then we make it through, hallelujah, and God will gather all of his elect together at the end of the second coming. Sorry you missed it. The elect here means Israel, not you. The church age, hallelujah, hear me, is made up of Jew and Gentile. We're caught up in the air. That's the bride of Christ, hallelujah. We come back with the Lord at the end, and now he's fixed to have a judgment on the earth. I've already showed it to you. Made up of goats and sheep and brethren, and all the nations fixed to be judged. No books are opened in that judgment. That's going to be at the great white throne judgment coming up. See, folks are not taught these things. And here it's referring to he takes all of Israel and brings them together because he protects Israel in the tribulation period. Is anybody seeing this, anybody? That's why it's so important. Because again, if this is true, that means that God saying he catches up, us up in the air can't be true either if what you're trying to say makes sense. It makes no sense at all. So it's talking about two different events. One is for us and here's about Israel. The second coming church has got nothing to do with you. You're part of it, but it's about Israel. That's why it's called the Day of Atonement or Yom Kippur. And it's important you understand what it means. Now, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to backtrack for a I gave you the fulfillment of it. Hallelujah, okay? The fulfillment is, is Christ. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come back for Israel, the Day of Atonement. Because when they have been fooled by Satan, the Antichrist, and they have made a false peace treaty and realize they've messed up, they're waiting still for the Messiah at the end of the seven tribulation period. He does come back, and it's the real Messiah, and he tears up all these nations who's come against Israel. Y'all getting hold of this, anybody? But let's go backwards a little bit. Now, if you read later Leviticus 16, you're going to find something there in the Old Testament that I want to, I share this with you every year just because it's a cool story in Scripture that will show you what it's talking about here, okay? The devil again is about Israel. 
It's talking about a day of Israel and their sins being atoned for. How many here knows that Israel's eyes was blinded in Scripture so he could create the covenant of the, of the new covenant of Jews and Gentiles to graft them into the commonwealth of Israel to start the church, hallelujah. But then he takes the blinders off of national Israel at the second coming, hallelujah. That's why he says their sins will be atoned for. Now, but before that in Old Testament, here's what would happen. The high priest at that time would have been Aaron. Y'all heard Gary teach on this many a times. They had something called the outer court and the inner court and then the holy of holies. How many of you ever seen Raiders of the Lost Ark? Anybody ever seen that movie? Okay. Y'all know, y'all seen the, the big Ark of the Covenant? And when you open it up, something comes out of there and it kills everybody who's looking at it. Y'all remember that? Okay. That's what it's talking about. That's actually in Scripture. Okay. The Ark of the Covenant was in the Holy of Holies. And no one could touch it. The stories in the Bible were those who was trying to carry it and it started falling over and they tried to steady it and it killed them immediately. You cannot touch God's holiness. You cannot touch God's power or you die. You and I can now, hallelujah. If you've been born again and God's Holy Spirit's inside you, the Bible tells you to come to Him boldly now. I can walk right on in there because of what Christ did. Without Christ, you cannot even be around God. Y'all get a hold of anybody. So in the Old Testament, you have the outer court, inner court, the Holy of Holies. So once a year on these feast days, the high priest would go in with a rope tied to him with bells on it. And he had to go through all these rituals, blood rituals, killing animals. And he'd enter in in a certain way, at a certain time when God told him to, after the rituals was done. And he had to pour the blood on the mercy seat and sprinkle it seven times for Israel's sins to be covered. Now watch this. If he did it wrong... They had the rope tied to him because if the bell started ringing, they had tried to pull him out of there so God's presence would not kill this man. And that's how important what Christ did for us. And it's important that you grab a hold of this because this happened really. Now here's what happened in Scripture. Go ahead and read it for yourself. In Leviticus 23 and 16, you'll see this. The high priest would choose two goats, a sacrificial goat and a scapegoat. Now listen very carefully to this. One of the goats would give us life so he could go into the Holy of Holies. The other goat, though, would become a scapegoat. How many of you ever heard the word scapegoat in, in school or anything? In other words, it's like, you didn't do anything wrong, but we're going to blame it all on you, <laughs> and you're called a scapegoat. Happens all the time in school. Happens, in, happens on time on teams, baseball teams, football. You might have friends that have done that to you. They did something wrong, and then they're pointing at you while well, you didn't do anything wrong, and then, then, then the teacher comes up, or cops comes up, and they're like, hey, he's the one who did it. That's called a scapegoat, or someone taking on that role, which is what Christ did. Here's, here's, here's what I'm talking about. The scapegoat, the way the ritual went was this right here. They pretty much have a tent, most of the time right on the edge of a cliff. And if this scapegoat would run off the cliff, then it died, hallelujah. The sacrificial goat took away our sins. The scapegoat would take away the curse of the sins. If he ran off the cliff and died, then we're going to be blessed this whole year. I'm just going to tell you, I'm paraphrasing here for you. But if that goat did not die, he goes out here in the desert, and he now gets thirsty, he tries to come back, to his first water source. What they would do is tie a red ribbon upon the goat's horn and the other part on the ribbon of the, of, of the door. Okay? And they'd watch it for days and days and watch it. If that ribbon turned white, that means that goat died out here in the desert and they're blessed for another whole year. That means not only will the sacrificial ghost blood took care of their sins for a year, but the curse of the sin on the scapegoat was also taken away and they're going to have a blessed year. Okay, this happened every year, every year, every year, every year. Now, this is important to know this. Why? Because if you go back in Scripture and you look, here's what happened. You know that in A.D. 70, 
is when the temple was destroyed. But years before that, if you understand what the Bible is talking about, 40 years before that, in A.D. 30, the ribbon stopped turning white. Why? Because the Lamb of God, which is Jesus Christ, died as that animal, as that sacrificial animal on the exact day of the feast day. And when he did, he fulfilled all this for the whole world. Hallelujah. Y'all can hold this. That's why it's important to see Christ fulfills these things exactly when God says so. So what does the Bible say about this? Look at Romans 3.23. We're almost done. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Look at what Isaiah says. Turn to Isaiah 1.18. Watch this. Come now, he says, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be scarlet, which is red, they shall be as white as snow. Though be red like crimson, they shall be as wool, white. It's referring to the same goat story that I told you. The ribbon on the door and then upon um, the, the goat's head that would turn red to white. This is what it's talking about. Your sins, church, have been forgiven. It's turned as white as snow. Hallelujah. How many of you believe that? So don't go to a church that tries to put you down and says, come as you are. Then as you come as you are, then it's like, now get back into the law. Do it this way, talk this way, act this way, walk this way. No, no. Because now you're trying to do it the old way that has not been forgiven. God has fulfilled the law, hallelujah. How many believe that? The law has been put inside you. You're being born again. That's why it's so important that you see what God's word really says. Last verse, go to Hebrews. I'm going to show it to you in scripture and we're going to close here. Hebrews 9. And look at verses 11 through 15 and we're done for today. But Christ, being a high priest, he's taken the place, watch this now, of Aaron the high priest, watch, of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but of his own blood, watch, he entered once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctify to the purifying of the flesh, how much more should the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve a living God? And for this cause uh, is he the mediator of the New Testament that by means of death for the redemption of the transgression that were under the first testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Bottom line is this right here. Jesus Christ became the sacrifice and he became the high priest. Hallelujah. He died for us and he entered in for us. And what has this got to do with anything Greek? Nothing. That's why I teach about the Hebrew. That's why I was storing the Bibles that way. That's why it's important. We're always bringing this kind of stuff up. The fulfillment of what Christ did. That's why it's so, so important. Now, this is the whole point of us teaching on the second coming of Christ. Next week, we're going to get into it deep again about the thousand year millennium. Who has ever heard of the thousand millennium before? That's talking about at the very end of time. God, when he comes back here and he makes war against all these nations, there's going to be so much blood that he kills these people with. It comes all the way up to the bridle of, of the horse, on the, neck, on the neck of the horse, blood everywhere. Now watch. But he leaves a third of the people of the nations alive for a purpose. And that's what's going to be next week. Because you're going to start seeing the Christ when he comes back, after the judgment, I said, God, God, God finished showing you. You're going to have now a new heaven and a new earth created, and we're going to be here on the earth now for a thousand years back on this earth. At the end of that thousand years is when you have the great white throne judgment. We're going to get into that soon. 
I want you to see these things, guys, because all the things I learned in church years ago are just not in the Bible. I'm not being mean. It's just not, that's not what, that's not what it says. Okay? That's called religion to make you feel better. Because I've been taught my whole life, it's all about the church. No, we're just a part of it. It's not just all about the church. We're a part of it, hallelujah, and we are a big part of it. But God has a plan for Israel. God has a plan for you, church. He also has a plan for the, for the tribulation saints as well as the raptured saints. Hallelujah. Y'all getting a hold of this, anybody? That's why it's so important that you know who you are and where you fit in. If you don't know these things, Satan will eat your lunch. What do you mean, Greg? Well, you're going to go to school. Then you're going to go to college. Then you're going to get out, find you a sweetheart. Then you're going to get married. You're going to get you a house. You're going to get a job. You're going to fall into the center of everybody else does. Paying bills, going to sleep, getting up, paying more bills, going to work, paying bills. I mean, it's the same, same old thing over and over and over and over and over. And we think we're doing good. So somewhere along the line, you start realizing the drugs don't work, the alcohol don't work, okay? The fun stuff don't work, buying stuff don't work, having five houses don't work, nothing works. So what's, so something's missing, and you're empty. And until that's filled, <laughs> until you get born again, you're never going to be happy. Because listen, when you're born again, I can have nothing or I can have millions of dollars and have everything. Don't, don't, it don't really matter to me. In other words, when I say don't ma matter, I want to have more than less, but I'll have peace of whatever I go through in life. Hard times, good times, and I'm not sitting here blaming God for everything. I understand I've got peace in Christ. Does that make any sense? That's what being born again means. So as we get ready, if you don't mind standing, as we get ready to close here, if you're here today and you're not born again, I can't save you, but I know who can. His name is Jesus Christ. As we get ready to play some music and close out, if you walk out this door today and the Holy Spirit has pricked your heart and has, and has convicted you and it says, listen to what this man is saying and get born again and you don't do it, and you walk out this door and you have a car wreck and you die, you will go to hell. No such thing as purgatory. No such thing as a second chance after death. Don't work that way. Now or never. Now if you have been born again, thank God for that. Thank God for that. But the next part for you is, are you doing God's will? Are you where you're supposed to be? Are you listening to the Holy Spirit? Are you hurting? You sick? You need to be healed? What's your needs? I don't know. God knows. But all of us need God. Amen. So if you want to come pray for love when you do that, you want to come get born again, you do that. What's your need today? There's nothing too big for God. Please don't take it for granted. I'm going to close right here with this right here. Um, here's what we're going to close with. If you're here and you know you're born again, please, this week, think about this right here. Are you hearing the voice of the Holy Ghost? Are you too busy with life? Slow down. Whatever it takes, slow down. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Here's why I'm saying that, because you can go your whole life and be born again and saved and never do the will of God. He's not going to do it for you. He ain't going to make it happen either. I tell you, I've missed several things in my life that I know God's put in front of me and I missed it. I'm sure you have too. There are many things in your life you've missed. And one day when you get heavy, you're going to see it. God can do anything, but you've got to hear. And I promise you, if all the noise is around you, you're not going to hear. Hearing is inside your spirit, man. So listen to the Holy Spirit this week and let God show you what His will is. Thomas, you mind closing in prayer?